Next on Contemplate. You will never find any group of people who you agree with all of them all the time. Or, frankly, that you enjoy being around them all the time, including your own family. Amen? (laughs) Right. You will never find any group of people that you agree with all the time. That doesn't mean that you split off. That was Pastor David Robinson from Axe Church in Vancouver, Washington. And this is Contemplate. Think about it. When the church began in Acts chapter 2, they went from around 120 people to over 3,000 in just one day. And in verse 42, we read about some important things they all did to grow in faith. Today, we'll look at the apostles' teaching and fellowship. Here's Pastor David. My family and I wanted to go to a movie the other night. It was Friday night, and we had said, hey, let's go to a movie. Should we go see this Batman, Superman thing, or we should go go see something else? And there was a movie that came out called God's Not Dead 2. And so I went, and I I looked at the reviews. And I'm looking through the reviews. And one of the reviews by a guy named Tom Miller from Westminster, Missouri, said this. He says, by the way, the first movie, which was called God's Not Dead... Uh, may have done well, but only in financial terms. Critics hated it, and the only people who liked it were hardcore Christians. And it struck me that um, that's an interesting statement. Because if there's such a thing as hardcore Christians, there must be some other kind of Christians. And we could argue about whether Tom is talking about Christians who are serious and not serious, or whether Tom's talking about Christians that don't annoy him and Christians that happen to annoy him. It, it could be either one, right? But I don't think that there's any question, the Scripture's pretty clear, that there really are those who are hardcore Christians and those who are, I don't know, softcore Christians? <laughs> Weak Christians? Easy. Those who aren't that serious about it? And, interestingly, those in the world can tell the difference. They can tell the difference. And so I think that we have to ask ourselves a question today. As we're about to go through some material from Acts, we need to ask ourselves, if a guy like Tom came up to you after making a comment like this and said to you, don't worry, you're cool, you're not one of those hardcore Christians, how would that make you feel? You need to think about how would that make you feel. You're being let off the hook to some extent, right? You're still cool because you're not a hardcore Christian. But maybe it should make you feel bad in a different way. So in the book of Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 17, Jesus is speaking to the angel of the church of Laodicea. And he says this. It says, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth, because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked." We need to think as we read about these people in the early church and the passion that informed their Christianity. We need to think about whether or not maybe we've become too rich in different ways to need or to want God. Are we all supposed to be hardcore Christians? That's the question that we need to ask ourselves. What's the nature of Christianity? We have... The first people here that we just talked about who through the saving grace of Christ became followers of Christ. And we've got to see what did it look like for them. So if we go back to some of the stuff we did last time, we look um, that after Peter explained to these folks that they had rejected and murdered Jesus, we see their response in Acts 2 verse 37. It says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? So these guys hear about Jesus, and they're cut to the heart, right down to the center. 
And they're asking, what shall we do? What do we need to do? And then Peter tells them, he says, go repent and be baptized. And then the scripture tells us in the 41st verse of the second chapter of Acts, then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. These people received it gladly. That's an understatement. These people came in with their whole heart. What shall we do? What do I have to do? Anything, tell me. I'm a sinner. I realize where I'm going. I realize the direction I'm headed in life. I know that I am the one who killed Jesus or I'm responsible for his death, just like we all are for our sin. And they needed to know and they were told, hey, repent and be saved. And they did so. And in order to do that, to choose to follow Jesus Christ at that time, remember, they're choosing to follow a guy that a few days earlier was killed by the Roman Empire at the behest of the leaders of their people. So this was not a person that would have been easy to follow. They had to be all in. But they were all in because they recognized that Christ had paid their ransom. He had paid for their sins, and they recognized how serious their sin was. Now, we've got to be as Christians like these folks were. And so the, the book of Acts is going to tell us what they were like and what they lived like. We need to listen very carefully so we know how to follow Christ like those who were pierced to the heart followed Christ because we need to be pierced to the heart as we follow Christ and not become rich or believing that we're rich when really we're naked, wretched, and poor. But remember, as we've talked about, just believing something to be true, just believing doesn't really do anything for you. The demons believe and shudder. So just believing isn't getting you anywhere. We have to get to this point to where we're cut to the heart. We've got to be transformed through the word of God, not just intellectually accepting, yes, I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Yes, I believe that he has the power to take care of my sin, but I'm just really not sure that I've done anything that bad. We can't be that way. We have to be transformed, completely transformed by the word. We must stand ready for anything because as Christians, you need to stand ready for persecution and for pain as well as for joy and peace and comfort and praising and worshiping our king and recognizing that he has conquered and is more than a conqueror and that we are too. But we do have to be ready for the difficult times and only the hardcore Christian is going to make it through the difficult times. It's in resting in the hope of our salvation and waiting for his return that we can be with him, that we'll find our peace, and that's what will give us the ability to daily face the perils and dangers and difficulties and persecutions of being a Christian and putting on that armor of God every day. But if we're not a hardcore Christian, We'll never have what we need to do that day by day, and eventually we'll fall away and go the easy way. So let's look at the next verse that we have in Acts. This is chapter 2, verse 42. This is right after these 3,000 people came to know the Lord and were baptized, and it says this. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. So we have four things listed here that were part of the church from the very beginning and are still part of the church today. Four things that made up this early church. This is how they rolled. This is what they did. And these are things that we continue to do that you see in the church to this very day. This is what they did from the beginning. They devoted themselves to these things. The first thing they devoted themselves to, according to the verses, the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now, they had the apostles there to teach them. These were the men who had actually walked with Jesus for three years on the earth and had learned all the things that Jesus had taught. And they had the Holy Spirit come upon them at Pentecost and were given the ability to understand the Scripture even more through that. So these were people who had a lot of knowledge about what it meant to follow Christ. And they were there with them. They were able to preach to them. So these people devoted themselves to learning, which was, you know, practical learning, like how we should live our lives on a daily basis, how to be a good mother or a good father, or a good husband or wife or an employee or an employer, son or a daughter, whatever, right? 
We need to learn those things, the practical side of Christianity, the practical side of living, what I would call kind of the self-help side of things, which we as Americans, we love self-help, love it. Go to the bookstore. It's going to be probably the most popular section there, how you can become whatever, skinnier, richer, better, taller, whatever, all these things. You're going to find a book on it, and you're going to read about it. So you can get self-help. And in Christianity, we have that too. Now, ours is a little bit better than those books. We have a better book. But self-help is a big part of what we look for. And it's an important part. But when we're talking about being devoted to the apostles' teaching, we're also talking about something much, much deeper. It means that they were pressing in to learning the deep spiritual truths about God. There's ample evidence in the Bible that the relationship that we have with God, the church, and Christ is like a marriage. It's like a marriage. This is, this is the relationship that we see evoked in Scripture when we're trying to think about what it means to know God and to be with Him. And so when I was in my first semester of law school, it was a very, very difficult time. If, if anybody has ever been to law school or knows an attorney or someone who's been to law school, you've probably heard horror stories about what the first semester of law school is like. It is one of the most intense academic experiences that you can have. You're literally trying to learn an entirely new regime of thinking and the way that you've been studying this way your whole life and everything changes and you've got all this stuff to learn and you've got to learn it in a new way and it's very difficult and it takes a lot of concentration and it's very intense. And during this time, my wife got a haircut. And she had had long hair, and she cut about six inches off of her hair. And about three days later, she asks me, have you noticed that I've cut a whole bunch of my hair off? And I was like, no. Um, So the women out here right now are like, oh, I hate this guy. Yeah. I was so focused on law school and learning this kind of thing that I literally did not notice that my wife completely changed the way she looked. And it hurt her feelings, and and it, and it taught me a lesson. It taught me a lesson because it's important that if you're in a relationship and if you're in a marriage that you put time and energy and effort into, I don't know, noticing what they look like. Right, but we're supposed to be pressing into this relationship. So when we, when, when we're, when we're looking at the apostles' teaching, when we're looking at understanding and devoting ourselves to the apostles' teaching, we are not just talking about the sort of self-help side of how to be a good father and so on. Like I said, that's important, but we're talking about pressing deep, like you do in a marriage over 10 and 20 and 30 years, getting to know this person more and more and more moving into the deeper nuances of who they are. God's calling us into that. That's what he wants from us. He wants relationship and intimacy. So when we're talking about the apostles teaching and following it, we're talking about that, which is why we press into this stuff as we go through what we do here on Sunday mornings, what we do in life groups. We're pressing into the depth of what it means to know God. See, God wants this intense relationship with you. He made you special. He uniquely gifted each and every person in this room. And part of the way you come to understand who you are and what your giftings are is in pressing into knowing who he is. And the more you know who he is and who you are in him, the more you understand who you are and the gifts that he's given you to make you uniquely you. See, uh, we celebrate athletes, uh, movie stars, um, folks that do whatever, folks that are good at certain things. We sort of celebrate them. We, We sort of idolize them and lift them up. But to God, he doesn't see things like that. That's not the way that he sees the world. In fact, to God, you are famous. When he's thinking about people, he's thinking about you. He's your biggest fan. Why? Because he made you. He took the time to think about you specially and make you. That should be humbling to you. That should humble you to know that the guy that made the stars thought very specifically about who you were when he made you, that he has gifted you uniquely to be the very best 
person ever created at that thing that makes you you. There will come a time for those who follow Christ when you and God in heaven will have a secret that only you and he know. The Bible says he'll give you this name that's between the two of you. You're going to have a secret between you and the God of the universe. He cares about who you are individually. How do you honor that care and that love that he's given you? By pressing in to the apostles' teaching. By pressing in to knowing him more. By going deeper. By understanding the big story more. By understanding who God is more. So that's why we do that. That's why we do that. Because God loves you more than any person ever could. Now you are to love God more than you love any other person. You're to press into him. He sent Jesus to prove it. He sent his own son to die for you for your sins to prove how much he loved you so that he could be with you. Okay. Now, you got to know. You got to know that life in Christ is an awesome life. It's an awesome life, but it requires these things that we're talking about today. And one of the things it requires is that we press in to this teaching to go beyond the preliminary things. We could talk every week about the basics. Christianity is this thing and that thing and this thing, these little basic things. We could do that every week, and and there are people who probably like to do that. But that's not what we're going to do here because we're called to dig into his word and to discover who he is and all the mystery and wonder of him, just like your spouse, that you try to discover all the mystery and wonder. Except with God, it's all good that you find out. With your spouse, that's not always the case, right? Except for me. It's always the case for me. Um, so that these apostles, the apostles teaching, they're explaining these truths. They're explaining who God is, what God, who Jesus has revealed himself to be, who the Holy Spirit has revealed Jesus to be to them, how the Old Testament fits into it. And then, of course, eventually they write this stuff down through the power of the Holy Spirit because, of course, they were going to die. So they write this down, and we continue to this day to have the apostles' teaching right here, which is why we're doing this right now. What Luke wrote down that we're going through right now is what we're doing right now that the church has continued to do for all of these years. We do that. We press in the apostles' teaching. So um, number two, fellowship. The early church did fellowship. Now, what does that mean? It sounds like a very Christianese type of word, something that Christians say, oh, let's fellowship together. Let's go to the fellowship hall and we'll have some fellowship. But you don't talk like that. You can call your friends up and say, hey, you want to go fellowship today? We'll go down to, you know, just do some fellowship. Just hang out. <laughs> it is. It's a Christianese type of word, right? You only hear Christians really say the word fellowship, generally speaking. But it actually is really an important word because it denotes closeness and community. All right? There's an intimacy with the word fellowship. They were together. The church was together to learn together to encourage one another, to care for the physical needs of the body, to care for the emotional and the spiritual needs of the body, and to enjoy one another as a family, as a family of Christ. See, we have the same Father. As we come to Christ and as we know him, God the Father is our Father. We're brothers and sisters. That's a real thing. And so we become family. And we fellowship as a family. We get to know one another. We get to know one another. And in Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25, Scripture says this, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more, the more, as you see the day approaching. There are those who disagree with this fellowship aspect. There are those who disagree with this practice of the church. In other words, getting together as a church. But those those who disagree are not disagreeing with the church. They're disagreeing with the Scripture, and they're disagreeing with what the church has always been. The church has always been about fellowship. There are a lot of people who say, oh, I'm against this type of church, or I'm against that type of church. I don't like the way they do music, or I don't like the way that guy preaches, or I don't like the fact that they don't have a you know, knitting club or a softball team or this program or that program. I'm just looking for the right church right now. I'm really not going anywhere. There are people who kind of have that attitude, but the question is not what 
place can you find to go that will serve you or that will make you happy? That is not the question. The question is, is this place Christ's body? Are these people Christ's body? Have I been called? Have I been called to fellowship and service with these people? And if the answer, when you attend and and check out a church, you ask the Lord that sincerely and the answer is no, then the thing that you do is not, okay, well, I don't need to go to church. The next question is, okay, where have you called me to service and fellowship? Because this is clearly the pattern of the church from the beginning, and you've called us not to forsake gathering together in fellowship. You will never find any group of people who you agree with all of them all the time. Or, frankly, that you enjoy being around them all the time, including your own family. Amen? (laughs) Right. You will never find any group of people that you agree with all the time. That doesn't mean that you split off. I mean, we're really good at doing this. We split, okay, I don't like this church. Uh, it's too big or it's too small or it's too this or it's too that. And you go there, and then, and then we start going to this, you know, where you see people and hey, look, I'm not trying to offend anybody, but we have people go basically almost to this like, then it goes house church and it goes, well, just my family, me and my family, we kind of do it together. Well, here's the thing. That pattern will never end. Eventually you'll get sick of them too. And then it's just you. I'm the church. Me and the Holy Spirit. Let me just tell you something. Me and the Holy Spirit is not a sign of spiritual health. It's a sign of spiritual pride. You cannot do it on your own. You were never intended to. You were never intended to. We are to be a body of Christ. We're not to forsake this gathering because when we do this, when we, when we go, no, I don't like this one, I don't like this one, I don't like this one, or we just hop from church to church and never integrate truly have fellowship with a body, which is the hallmark of Christianity in the church, then relationship and community just isn't happening. And when relationship and community isn't happening, the church just isn't happening. It is worth considering, just considering, whether or not you might not be right about everything. It's worth thinking about. I'm just saying, okay? It's possible. If people in the church have hurt you in the past, and that's what's keeping you from fellowship, the call on your life is not to isolate yourself. The call on your life is forgiveness. It's forgiveness. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32 says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Here's the thing. Forgiveness is healing. Forgiveness is healing. Just like you were healed. Just as God in Christ forgave you, and by his stripes you were healed, you're called to forgive. Part of being in community, part of being around other people, is that they sometimes hurt you. You don't then pull away. It's now time to practice the discipline of forgiveness that you're called to do. The church certainly isn't perfect because it's made up of people. As a friend of mine has said, where there's body life, there's body odor. And it's so true. But with all its flaws, the church, the body of Christ, is the way and place God wants us to grow in Him. And if you need a place to grow in your own faith, I hope you'll give Acts Church in Vancouver, Washington a try. You already know the teaching is great, so come see us this Sunday morning. Get directions and all the info you need at actschurchnw.org or call 360-885-9000. On the next episode, we'll look at more important pillars of the church, and I hope you'll check it out here on Contemplate. Contemplate.